وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما على الإمام المنتظر وحجة الله الثاني عشر ابن العسكري المنتظر ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فإن الله الصادق العليم قال في كتابه الكريم القرآن الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ووضع الكتاب وترى المجرمين مشفقين مما فيه ويقولون ما لهذا الكتاب لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحساها السلوات Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're almost approaching the end of our series. The last few nights. And then I wish you goodbye. But despite last night being a very long night, and so far as the length and the duration of the lectures are concerned. Because I believe it was an hour and 40 minutes. But this is where you would have to understand my problem. That several permutations and combinations keep going through my head. Because at times I have to look at the watch. At times I have to have the lecture decided. At times, I have to keep the Urdu in mind, I have to keep the English in mind. So despite that length of time, I eventually did manage to also make a slight lapse and make a slight, slight slip. Not slip in content, but slip in, in the statement. Because if you realize last night, that when we were discussing those groups that, would be, that were to be brought onto the plains of Qiyamah and those groups that would be brought on the Day of Judgment, the tradition of the Holy Prophet, and then those three separate groups that we discussed and mentioned, at that point of time, before I entered into the, the Masaib, I had mentioned one group in which we had stated that this would be that group when it would be ordered to be brought onto the plains of Qiyamah. They would be brought onto the plains of Qiyamah in the state that they would be held by angels and branches of thorns would be taken and inserted into their eyes. And then when those branches are pulled out, everything that is there in the sockets would come out, inclusive of the eyeballs and inclusive of the muscles and the tendons and the cartilages and whatever and whatever. At that point of time, one thing that we failed to mention was what was the offense and what was the sin of these individuals necessitated them to get the sort of a punishment. Most of you must have realized it. But still it becomes a responsibility to state it from here since it had started from here. It becomes our responsibility to state from here. At this point of time when the Prophet is asked that who are those individuals who would be sub subjected to that kind of intense punishment, the response of the Prophet was that that everything that God has given has got a responsibility and a responsible way of usage. The hand given by God has a responsibility and we have got a responsible way of using it. Eyes that have been given is a bounty of God and we are duty bound to use it in an appropriate manner. These are those individuals who were not using their eyes in an appropriate manner. 
and numerous times it has been approached it has been told to us that these ni'mat would need to be used in things that are for the service of Islam or for away from or for usage that does not entail them to be used for haram these are those individuals who would see things that Allah has ordained upon the people haram to be seen when haram things are seen by the eyes then these eyes need to be punished and subsequently the person needs to be punished things that we see things that our youths see things which are not required for us to see and I would not just say not required haram upon us to see if the, if the eyes go and make a mistake of seeing those things which are not supposed to be seen, those haram movies, those manner in which the ladies are seen, the things in photographs, in magazines, on the internet, whether it is pornography or what not, which are absolutely haram and forbidden by Islam and haram and forbidden by God, despite the acts of forbidden and instructions of forbidden issued by Allah, if we choose to ignore these things and continue to see those things then again as I keep saying it is to our peril and these are the things that are so humans are so susceptible towards it and the youths are specifically so susceptible towards it there's a request that there are mu'mineen that are coming inside and there are no place there is no place for them to sit inside so I would request the mu'mineen if you could step forward so that these mu'mineen can sit inside. Not only would it serve to establish a sense of discipline over there, but every individual that comes in, those who allow them to come will benefit from the rewards. Please. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. After having understood that, now we move into the next phase. And now we are eventually approaching that scenario where and for which our entire creation has been created for. That is to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give the accounting of what we have been doing in this life of this world. But for this to take place, because now the resurrection has taken place, now the orders have come, Qum, rise from your graves, now the people have got up from their graves, and now they're about to enter, and they have entered, as per the discussion last night, onto the plains of Khayama. Now is the time when the accounting will begin, and now is the time when all these groups are placed at their respective positions onto the plains of Qiyama that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His absolute splendor and majesty will now make an entry onto the plains of Qiyama. Here we have to understand that whenever we will talk tonight and in subsequent lectures that God comes, God's presence, God's talk, God's words and God's sound. We have to understand one thing that God is not an entity that has a body. This is metaphorically speaking that God is coming because now he's making his presence manifest and felt and so it is stated that he is making his presence felt but God has no body Quran says he cannot be compared to anything nor can anything be compared to him any such entity on which you put the name thing cannot be applied to God and God cannot be compared to anything he is ever present he is omniscient he is all knowing and all present so the fact that you say that Allah Allah will come does not appear and is not worthy of mentioning God is there at all times but only because of the fact that at times he is there but he doesn't make his presence very manifestly manifest and very openly clear we say he's not there and when he exposes himself by means of his attributes we say oh now he has come but that doesn't mean God has a body that comes and goes and this is something that we need to keep in our minds in the course of tonight's lecture and possibly tomorrow night's
But now that stage has come when the accounting needs to begin. But before the actual discussion and the accounting takes place, and I will have to finish the accounting today because then from tomorrow night and day after tomorrow, we have to identify those bottlenecks and those things that cause a person to enter into these punishments and then find a solution from these punishments. So the lecture of tomorrow night, because after tonight, I will have only two more lectures. One lecture tomorrow night, one lecture on the, on the, on the night of Friday. And in these two lectures, I will have to focus on those things which are a problem and causing people to enter into these problems as well as finding a solution for those problems. However, for those who have been paying attention carefully and have been analyzing these lectures, you would realize that even yesterday's last night's lecture was also a similar kind of lecture in which the problems were stated. And once the problems are stated, the solution is so simple. Those people who are coming with their hands and feet cut for, for troubling their neighbors, obviously an intelligent person would know that if he does not want to get involved into that kind of a punishment, his behavior with his neighbors need to be improved. If a person is coming upside down, it has to be understood that this person is basing all his income on interest. And now if he has to ensure that he doesn't fall into this mess, then he has to make sure that his income now becomes free of interest. And all those ten groups and all those three other groups that we mentioned, all of them indicated the punishment for a particular sin. So by consequence, we understand that if we need to get out of that problem we don't want to fall into that problem those things need to be avoided by us but tomorrow night I want to emphasize on one very important issue and then the remaining thing on the night after that but as far as tonight is concerned before a person stands before God one small little incident takes place one small little event takes place before this man is made to stand before that majestic glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what we refer to as the book of deeds this is what we refer to as the name amal every individual who has been brought into this world has a 24-hour surveillance camera placed upon his face. These surveillance camera monitor each and every act of this person, each and every behavior of this person, each and every word spoken by this person, and each and every thought that passes through the mind of this person. In normal times, as we know it, the cameras that we have got will only observe the physical features and the physical movements. If it has the ability to, ca to capture audio, it will also capture the words and the speeches. But the camera that God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in front of every person not only captures the physical movements and the physical behavior, but also captures the spiritual movements and the spiritual behavior. A thought that passes through the mind is recorded inside. A, sim a feeling that will go through mind is recorded inside. A niyah that would go through the soul is recorded inside. It is something that one just cannot escape from. And this is what is mentioned in the beginning of the verse of the lecture when I recited that verse in which Allah says, al-kitab," And when the book shall be presented to them and when every person will have a look at that book, the person and each and every one will cry out Yahweh Latina, O woe be upon us. What kind of book is this? kitab. What kind of book is this? Because when man is given his book of deeds, the book of deeds is a book in which everything that man does in this world is recorded. Whether it is a good deed, it is recorded. Whether it is an evil deed, it is recorded. From the time he is born till the time he dies, everything that a person does is recorded over there, captured and, and, and made mahfud to be given to him on the day of judgment once he enters the plane this book will be given to him and it would be said take this because this is what you had been doing into this world which has which you were sent to by Allah and on the basis of this book will the accounting take place page by page line by line act by act 
thought by thought allah will take accounting from for every person and on that day the this scenario would be very ajeeb but we will come to that scenario let us first finish this issue about this book because when this book is given to every individual the individual will start turning the pages and when he starts turning the pages he will find everything that he had been doing everything that he had been doing everything that he had been doing recorded over there and i would want you to rewind our lectures to the third or the fourth lecture wherein we had said that everything is being recorded and will be shown to us at that time i had mentioned an incident of ayatullah khomeini coming in the dreams of his son said ahmad at that time do you remember what imam khomeini said to his son he said my son said be careful about how you behave in this world because whatever you will do whatever you will do will be recorded at that time said ahmed asks him oh father when you say everything will be recorded what do you mean at that time imam khomeini raises his hands and says when i raise my hand that raising of the hand is also recorded that is why when this person will read the book quran is quoting him ya waylatana wo bi upon me ma li hadhil kitab what kind of book is this la yughadiru saghiratan wala kabiratan this is not omitted not even a small thing not even a big big thing illa ahsaha everything has been written into it and in tafsir of this our sixth imam sadiq ali muhammad jafar ibn muhammad al sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam the sixth imam is asked ya ibn rasulullah what does allah mean by saying that this man will say la yughadiru saghiratan wala kabiratan neither a small thing saghira nor a big thing kabira will be missed is missing from this book what does allah mean that this person is going to comment in this fashion to imam sadiq says when allah says la kabira wala saghira neither small nor book it nor big it means that everything that the person does will be recorded and then he does a tafsir he says ma min lahadatin wala kalimatin wala naql qadmin wala shay'in fa'aluhu fi dunya illa dhakara there is not a moment of action of this person that will not be recorded there is not a single letter that will come out of his mind of his mouth that will not be recorded there will not be a single step that he has taken in this world that will not be recorded and there will not be a single action that he has done in this world that will be omitted and when he sees this he will say ma li hadha al kitab if you were told the moment you turn left i'm going to write it down the moment i turn right i'm going to write it down the moment i blink my eyes i'm going to write it down i'm going to say ma li hadha al kitab what kind of a book is this everything is written inside it nothing is missing not the big things nor the small things and this is the reason it is said that when everything is written we have this 24 hour camera which is recording this and what is this 24 hour camera according to traditions according to traditions and according to the ayat of the quran wa idh yatalaqqa al mutalaqiyan an al yamin wa an al shimal qa'id ma yalfidh min qawlin illa ladayhi ar raqib wa atid every time this man in this world speaks out there are two of our guards waiting to capture every second of this person's life There are two guards of ours with a 24 hour 24 7 cc camera waiting to pick up all that he wants two angels nominated by God, God primarily for this purpose to note down everything that man does according to traditions and according to this ayat of the Quran the name that comes is wa ma yalfadhu min qawlin illa wa ladayhi raqib wa atid one person's name is raqib the other person's name is atid everything that is being recorded that is being done is being recorded by these two individuals by these two by these two angels in certain cases in the quran they are referred to as kiram al katibin they are referred to as the holy the honored the dignified writers because they have been nominated by god to do these things and they've been nominated by god to write individual actions and every good deed is written by them every evil deed is written by them but even in this case allah always says that by default the primary sifat and the characteristic by means of which i will manifest myself 
the main characteristic by which I want to deal with the people. The underlying characteristic with which I want to interact with people is with mercy. It is only when a person transgresses the limits that I have said that I have to convert my mercy into jabbariyat, into qahariyat, into my anger, into my wrath. But default is I am a merciful God. It is upon you to leave me as a merciful God or make me manifest myself in your case as a jabbar God. And that is why it is said in traditions, when a person does good things, and I was discussing yesterday in one of the sessions, when a person does good thing, the angel who is supposed to write the good deeds is under instruction. As soon as a person does good thing, write it down. And when you are writing it down, write down ten times the rewards for one good deed. But when a person is committing an evil deed, the angel that is responsible for writing down the evil deeds, he says, as soon as this person commits an evil deed, do not write it down. Seven hours you will not write it down. You will give him an opportunity to do istighfar. You will give him an opportunity to seek forgiveness. If in this seven, these seven hours somebody does istighfar, forget about it and do not even write it down. It's only within seven hours of committing the sin, if a person does not do istighfar and seek forgiveness for God from God now you write it down but even after you write it down if you find him doing istighfar erase it for good things write it and give ten times the rewards for an evil thing don't write wait for seven hours even after seven hours no istighfar write it down but one is to one one sin one evil deed one sin there one good deeds ten good deeds rewards what else do you want from the mercy of God? But everything will be written. But one thing that goes ahead is that every person will have a book in which there will be his evil deeds written, in which there will be good deeds written on the day of judgment when all these people are made to enter into paradise, into, into the plains of Qiyamah. And they are put into the specific groups. Then they will be given these books. And they will be told based on what is written in this book, you will be asked and you will have to account to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one thing that is very interesting over here is that every Everybody will not be given the book in the same fashion. Everybody will not be given the book in the same manner. Tradition says different people will be given the book in different manners. And primarily all the people vis-a-vis -vis handing over the books are divided into two categories. One category consists of those individuals who are pious, who are righteous, who are the true obedient servants of God. And the other group will consist of the sinners and the fusak and the fujjar. The manner of giving the books to them will differ and as soon as they see the manner in which they receive the books at that moment they would realize where they are going to hand up where they are going to end up because tradition says those people who are righteous and who are pious will be given their book of deeds in the right hand whereas those sinners and the evil people and the fusak and the fujjar all those people who fall into the second category will be given their book in their left hand as soon as they receive their book they are all most sure to know that yes now we are now confirmed that we have messed up our lives we have messed up in the hereafter in the in the in the dunya so that now the consequences that our akhirat is getting spoiled people being given the book in the right hand some people giving the book given the book in the left hand and it is primarily for this reason that giving of the book in this manner either in the right hand or in the left hand and this is how it will be it will be said take your book as soon as he puts his hand forward he says no 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 not the right hand the left hand take this book no no not the left hand this is for you in the right hand at that time the people will realize in the manner that the book is given to them they will realize how the accounting will go the next step. And this is the reason it is said. And this is why the emphasis and the recommendation is made. That when we are doing the wudu and we are washing our right hand and the left hand, there is a dua when we are reciting the wudu for the right hand. And there is a dua when we are, when we are doing the wudu of the left hand. And when we are washing the right hand, the dua says, Oh Allah, I am washing my right hand. Ensure, I'm paraphrasing it and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a translation. We say that when we are washing the right hand, Allah, I am 
washing my right hand do ensure that on the day of judgment I get the book in my right hand because receiving the book in the right hand is an indication that I have gone through the test I have passed receiving the book in the left hand indicates that I might be a failure a very good possibility unless and until Allah's mercy comes and encompasses me so at the time of washing the left hand we say I'm Allah I'm washing my left hand do ensure that on the day of judgment the book is not given to me in this hand the book is given kitab la sagiratan wala kabiratan ajab book this is nothing is lost no word no action no step and no action no shay that is there in this world has been missed out and had this only be the case and if we have understood and have and should we understand this we don't need anybody else at times even we require external policemen when we talked about a few nights before that we should inculcate the concept of an internal policeman for our children whereby they are they fear Allah by themselves they don't fear their father or their mother this is also applicable to us if we understand this concept that 24 7 somebody is watching us none of us would commit a sin but the fact is that we become ghafil and it is so easy and I give this example on numerous occasions we have these walima, we have these wedding invitations where we go for the walima, right? While we are having the walima, we are eating our food. As long as there is people around and there is, there is nobody watching us in, 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 a, in an open gathering, we tend to eat in every manner that is possible, right? So you get those chicken legs, you pick it up and you start biting, right? You start biting, you start stuffing yourself. But the moment that film recorder comes and puts it on your face, then what do you do? You put that piece down, pick up a tissue paper, you try to wipe your face to show that, yes, I'm, I'm a very sophisticated guy. But the moment the camera is turned away, again that piece of chicken comes into the hand. Why? Why is this dichotomy? Why is this difference? Because now you know, if I don't put that chicken, for the rest of the life people will say, ah, look at him how much he likes chicken. So what do we do? We put it down. Why? Because we don't want it to be recorded. We don't want people to see whenever people see, Hi, look at that shaykh, see how he's eating. So we put it down. Why? Because we know somebody is watching. Because somebody is watching, we put ourselves in a very proper position. Our actions, our talk, our behavior, and fine sense of, of eating etiquette. But the moment the camera turns away, we're back to normal. If we understand that that camera is not there for just 15 seconds, it is there 24 7, there is nobody who can commit a sin. And this is one of the reasons why our Imams are masoom. Because they know 24 7, they are under the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For them, it is impossible to commit a sin in the eyes of in front when Allah is there. Not that they will commit a sin, but the very fact that He is watching them is enough deterrence for them to stay away from evil deeds. But you and me, because we become ghafil, we become heedless that somebody is watching. We are so ensconced in this world, and we are so much engrossed in this world, that we lose track of the fact that there is somebody watching us, and going to take us to task for whatever we do. Have we, or should we have that concept in mind, that we are constantly being watched? Nobody would commit a sin. We would not have this world the place it is now. But... That is why the day of judgment is there. If everybody was good over here, there was no need for a day of judgment. The book is given and now the hisab and the kitab needs to start. And now the, 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 the actual accounting on the day of judgment before the Almighty God. And this is something which in the Quran he's repeat, he's, he's, he's emphasizes. Huh? That these people that you see, inna ilayna iyabahum wa thumma alayna hisabahum. These people to us is their return. And upon us is the accounting. And tradition says on the day of judgment, when the entire mankind is placed onto the day of judgment, onto, onto the plains of Qiyamah, and every person has been given his book of deeds, now the accounting will begin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I will tell you how he will, how he will make his presence felt. But just a little snippets before we go into a little more detailed discussion. It is said every individual is now lying on the plains of Qiyamah. Because you've heard, a cataclysmic overhaul has taken place. There are no mountains, there are no trees, there are no shapes. It's just one plain flat piece of land in which the entire humanity from the time of Hadrat Adam alayhi salam till the last person who was born before the day of judgment is now standing over there. Billions and billions of people. We don't know when it is coming. Right now, 1400 years after the, after the, after the Islam at the Hijrat. 
thousands of years before that from the time of Hadrat Adam and how many thousands of more years afterwards we don't know but all of these people collected together on the plains of Qiyamah and Allah is doing accounting tradition says every person will be talking to God and God will be talking to every single person simultaneously at one moment of time and the talk will be so personal that every person will think that Allah is talking to me alone and the talk will take place in such a manner that the person standing beside this person will not know what the talk is taking place. This is our concept of God. Billions of people standing and that entity is talking to each and every people, every person about each and every aspect of that person's life. He doesn't need to look at the person's book to find out what this person has done. Billions of people standing and every single person's life from the time he is born till the time he has died, every single act written in the book, Allah, not for Allah. This is to do and complete the hujjat upon man and upon this person. That you may want to deny but everything is written over here. I don't need this book because I'm Allah. I'm Allah kulli shayin qadir. I know every single thing that every single person out of this billion population that is there is doing. So each one will be talking to God. And for each one Allah will be taking accounting. And for each action, and you heard, مَا مِنْ لَحْمَ لَحْزَاتِينَ وَلَا كَلِمَةٍ وَلَا نَقْلِ قَدْمٍ Nothing will be there except that Allah will be talking to each and every person and doing the accounting himself. This is our concept of God. This is our concept of a majestic God. But when this is going on, it is said that the, that the, that the, that the accounting will be so intense and so meticulous. Meticulous means the smallest thing will have to be answered for. The smallest thing will have to be accounted for and explained. And the explanation that, that our first Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. And the explanation that he does is, he uses a terminology, he uses a phrase. Once one of his, his companions by the name of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he happened to commit a casual lapse, which in the eyes of Imam was, was very intense. So he turns and tells uh, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, what have you done? Why did you do this? Don't you fear Nikash of the accounting? Here I would want to explain. He says, Don't you fear the Nikash of the accounting? What is Nikash? Nikash comes from the term Manakasha. Manakasha refers to a small thorn or a splinter, minute, that goes into our palms that enters into the flesh. That is called manakasha. Imam says, do you not fear the niqash al-hisab? Do you not fear the meticulousness of the hisab? Then he compares and uses that, that meaning which refers to a small little piece of, of wood, a splinter that has entered into the body. And you know, when a small little piece enters into the body, which is not very visible, it takes a, it takes a huge amount of time to take it out. So first a person has to take a pair of tweezers. Then he has to find out where that thing is. Then he has to put it under the light whether he can see the part protruding outside. And after so much effort he takes his pair of tweezers, tries to find out the tip, puts it up and takes it out. This is called manakasha. Imam says, do you not fear that the accounting will be so deep and so intense that the smallest thing hidden amongst all your deeds will be pulled out and you will be asked account for this. Why did you do this? But this accounting that will take place by God. But there are certain groups which tradition says will not be dealt by God. He will pass it on. Accounting is my prerogative. Inna ilayna iyabahum thumma alayna hisabahum. Surely their return is to us. And surely their accounting is upon us. But a certain group he will say, I don't want to deal with them. I will give it to some other people. Who are these people whom he will give to one? And who are these people 
who will be given to those people to explain by the sixth Imam. He's saying, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Beautiful tradition. And this is what Pisa keeps us going. He's saying, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَكَّلَنَ اللَّهُ حِسَابَ الشِّيَعَتِنَا عَلَيْنَا He's saying on the day of judgment, one group will be kept aside and will be given to us the Ahlul Bayt to do the Hisab. And then he says that group on whom or whose responsibility would be upon us to take the accounting would be the Shiites of the Ahlul Bayt. God will say the Shiites of the Ahlul Bayt, I don't want to do anything. You are the Imams, you deal with them. Then Imam says, when the Shiites come to us for the accounting, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will deal with them very leniently. We will deal with them very leniently. And then he says how? He's saying there will be some things that they owe us. We will forgive them. You owe us something, forgive you. There will be something that they owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that time, we will turn to God and says, Ya Allah, Ana Sadiq, I am Jafar Sadiq. You love me and I love you. For your sake and for my sake, I want you to pass on those rights that you are extracting from this man to us. Give it to us. Then let us deal with it. Allah will say, I will give you my rights. As soon as the Imam gets the rights, they say, now we've forgiven you. This is how the Imams behave. This is how the Imams will interact with us. All the things that are directly related to them, they will forgive. All those things related to Allah by means of which the Shia could get caught, the Imam will plead to God, pass that right to us. And Allah will say, Sadiq, you are asking me, take it. Because whatever you ask, I will give you. Because whatever I had asked you, you had given to me. <laughs> whatever I had asked, you gave to me in the dunya. So now in Akhirah, it is but natural that I, as Allah, go a step further. Whatever you ask, I will give you, but I will give it to you without even you asking me. You never asked me to do the hisab of the Shiites. I'm going to give you myself. Then Sa Imam Sadiq says, we will take the rights of God. We will take our rights and we will forgive the Shias because they're saying Hussain, Hussain. Because you say Hussain, Hussain, you're going to go to paradise. Because you're the Shia, you're going to go to paradise. But... There are certain conditions. One condition is that. And the primary condition. Look at what the tradition says. إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَ وَكَّلَنَ اللَّهُ حِسَابَ شِيَعَتِنَا On the day of judgment, Allah will, in, will, will, will place upon us the authority to do the hisab of shi'atina, our shi'ats. The condition over here is, you know what? The condition over here is not that Sheikh climbs onto the mimbar and says, Sheikh Shanawaz is a Shia. There is not the condition. The condition is Hussein comes and says, Aya, you are my Shia. This is where the difference lies. I may go to the top of Eiffel Tower and start clamoring, I am, Hus I am Fatima Shia. But is Fatima calling me a Shia? They say Shiatuna, our Shia. That means whomsoever we regard as Shia, we will deal with them. This is a big difference between I calling myself a Shia and Fatima calling me her Shia. This is where the crux lies. And this is where we fail to understand. And this is where many of us might face a lot of problem. Because of us falling into a laxity that we call ourselves a Shia, we will get classified into this group of Shia and have the benefits of all the things that have been mentioned in the tradition vis-a-vis -vis the Shiites. Little realizing the fact that the condition is they call us Shia, not that we call ourselves a Shia. We may call ourselves a Shia, but they may say, you're not a Shia, Bana. What Shia are you talking about? Eating somebody's money, you call yourself a Shia. And then you want, uh, you, you want me to take over your hisab, you're not going to come to me for hisab, you go to God. But, when this hisab is going on, there are certain things that we need to understand. That there are certain things that God will let go, because He is more merciful than Sadiq calls. It is just to show the people that look the importance I'm giving to these individuals. In this world, you never thought that they were so important. I want to manifest their importance, these 14 people. That right now, the entire control of the universe is in my hands. I am giving certain control to them. Understand their importance. Understand their status. Understand their rank. Understand their loftiness. That is the reason. But Allah is more merciful than Sadiq. Allah is more merciful than Fatima. There is no doubt about it. 
But over here, one thing, and I'm fighting against time as I'm looking at it. One thing that we have to understand over here is that amongst all the things, a lot of questions will be asked. Because for everything, there will be a question. Do you not fear the meticulousness of Hesab? Every small thing will be asked about. Everything will be asked about. But one thing that stands out, one thing that really emerges out of this, is again that same thing that I mentioned the other night. All the other things would be allowed to go. All the other things would be allowed to do. This is my haqq. You did not give. Astaghfirullah, I, 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 I can't do anything right now. I, can, I cannot even do istighfar because the doors of istighfar are closed. I cannot do anything else to you because now I, I cannot run away. لا يمكن الفرار من حكومتك دواء كمال Right? So I, I'm, I resign myself to whatever you do. Allah will say, forgiven. Go. Because there can be nobody more merciful than God. Tradition says all of these little, little things, even sometimes major things will be gone. He will ignore. You repent it. You know that I am the Lord. And you are nothing. Yes, gone, go. But there is one category Allah will say, no, you will not go. One category He will say, no, you will not go. You stand here. Till this is not sorted out, my friend, you are not moving anywhere. Haqqun Nas. I may be Arhamur Rahimin. I may be Rahman. I may be Rahim. I may be the most merciful of the merciful ones. In this I am not going to tend. Because then this will come directly in contradiction to my adalat and my justice. I cannot do that. You have done something wrong to some other human being. You have to sort it out with them before you come to me. And this is what it is said. Beware of haqqun nas. Beware of the rights of the people. Because there is no way. And why there is no way? Because there is a tradition of the first imam. Narrated by the fourth imam. The fourth Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin alayhi salatu was salam. Is narrating this. But if you have to just understand the importance of this haqqunas and how meticulous and how specifically focused that accounting on the day of judgment would be there, listen to this incident. Then we go to the, to the actual aspect. Since the Holy Prophet one day was moving with his companions. As they were going by the streets, the Prophet saw a camel. A camel. In olden days, camel was not only for traveling, but it was also used for, for carrying the goods. So as he was going, he happened to see that camel, in which the camel owner had, played some, had, play, had put some, some cargo, some, some luggage. But it was not just ordinary luggage, it was inordinately excess. That you could see that animal, the Prophet could see that animal's leg buckling under that immense weight. So he's asking, who's the owner of this place? Find him out. So they want to look around, they find the owner is not seen. He's saying, you see this animal that has been overburdened by this man? So the companions are saying, yes. He's saying, this man better watch out on the day of judgment because God will ask him, why did you overburden this camel? You get me what I'm stating? That camel is standing with an excessive load. The Prophet is stating that owner of that camel better beware. Huh? He will have to account on the day of judgment to God as to why he put that immense load on that camel more than he could bear. No, you did not get me. If Allah on the day of judgment can take into account an oppression done upon a camel, then would he let go the oppression done upon a human being? That is why it said, fourth Imam narrating, I heard from my father Hussain ibn Ali, who heard from his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali is stating, on the day of judgment, when a resurrection will take place, and individuals will be made to come out, an order will come, stand up. That order will not be in the form of words, it will be that second trumpet that will be blown. As soon as the second trumpet is blown, people will be made to come out of the graves. As they start coming out of, out of the graves, they would be told by the angels, you cannot stand here, you need to go towards that guard, towards that plains, where everybody would be standing. So as 
as people start coming out, as people start coming out, they will be assured, they will be pushed, they will be goaded towards that place where that frontier and the boundary of the plains of Qiyamah are there. But as soon as the first group reaches the doors of that entry, they would be told, you cannot move, you have to stop here till you get the permission. Now there when you are told to stop, you stop. There when you are told not to do something, you cannot afford. You just cannot do something and you will see tonight's lecture, how man becomes so helpless before the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will hear tonight, inshallah. We people will be asked, go and stand near the entrance to that plains of Qiyamah. People will start going, but they cannot move because they've been forbidden from going. As people start coming, people will start gathering. As people start coming out, they will start gathering. Tradition says, Imam Ali is narrating, a time will come when there will be a huge crowd over there. And we're talking about a huge crowd. Remember, we're talking about every single individual Muslim or non-Muslim from the Hadrat Adam's time up to the end. All of them standing over there. Tradition says the crowd will begin to rise and the crowd will begin to increase and the crowd will begin to increase. A time will come where they will be brushing their shoulders. A time they'll be coming, a time would come when they would start getting squeezed. They would not be able to move even a single feet. At that time a clamor would arise. We want to go forward. We want to go forward. It is at that time Imam Ali says that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his presence felt onto the plains of Qiyamah. As soon as that majestic Splendor, surrounded by the angels, those Mikael and Israfil and Israel and Jibrail and the Hamilin and those beautiful, those eight angels who are holding the arch of God and those major angels of the seven skies and the angels of the six skies and the angels of the fifth sky, all of them when they're converging and the entry of God, his personality, not as physical personality, but now he's making his presence felt as he's going to come, a sound shall come out, Ansetu ya ma'ash. O people of the Hashr, O people of the Day of Judgment, put your voices down because now the Jabbar is coming onto the plains of Qiyamah and his announcer is going to make an announcement. At that time, everybody, as soon as this hukum comes, everybody stops talking. Those 10 billion, 15 billion, 50 billion, I don't know. But that entire congregation, just by listening at this command, that the Jabbar is now coming, will just keep quiet. And as soon as they keep quiet, Imam Ali is saying, you will see a difference in their behavior. Because the moment they are told that the Jabbar is now coming for the accounting, everybody begins to shake. Everybody's eyes begin to water. Tears begin to fall down. Their limbs are shaking. Their limbs are moving. Lips are shaking they are looking around from here to there where is God when he comes how will he deal with us would he be merciful or would he be Jabbar would he be kind or would he be angry they don't know what to do but everybody is quiet at that time Allah's voice will reverberate in that entire plains of judgment and says inni ana Allah la ilaha illa ana I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no God except me and then he says my names are al Hakam and al Adil, my name is I'm Hakam. That means I'm the judge and I'm Adil. I'm a just judge. And today, all my judgment by default shall be based on Adalat, shall be based on equity, shall be based on fairness. Today, nobody will be oppressed. Today, nobody will be persecuted. Those people in the world who were oppressed will get their right. Those people in the world who were persecuted, they will get their right. Tonight and today is the day when I'm not going to leave the oppressors. I'm not going to leave the Zalim because I as the most powerful entity in the universe never commit a Zulm. So I will not tolerate any of those individuals who have committed Zulm. All the Madlumin remember today I am your supporter and all the Zalimin fear because I am your enemy. At that moment of time those who had been committing Zulm in this world would realize things are not going according to plan. Things are not going as to how they want and now they will be told enter the plains of Qiyamah because now the Jabbar wants to deal with you. On the day of judgment, there will be two phases and two phases in which God will deal with, with the people. At one time and by default, he is going to be the Adil. He is going to be just. You've done a sin, you will need to be punished. You've done a good deed, you need to be rewarded. One is to one exactly. Good deeds, by, uh, a good reward. Evil deeds, a punishment. That is what an Adil means. A just person is that. Exactly what you sow, that is what you shall reap. 
Nothing more than that. But that is where a problem will come. And that is where the Hakkunas will come forward. Because tradition says on the day of judgment he has made it a point. That I am going to be an Adil. Anybody who is oppressed, anybody in this world, in any form, I am going to avenge it. I am going to avenge the persecution and zulm of the Madloom. And tradition says, woe befall upon those who have taken somebody else's property. Woe befall people who have taken somebody else's izzat and respect and dignity. Woe befall those people who have dealt with other people and transgressed their haqq. Because on the day of judgment when this person will be talking, the zalim will come and the accounting is going on. At that time it will be said that you have taken somebody's money. You cannot go. Call that person. So the person will be called saying you have taken his money, return the money to him. You want to go to paradise? Return the money to him. Day of judgment, we hardly have clothes to wear. Remember what we had said? No clothes to wear, what money? Saying nothing going. You are not moving from your, I am Adil. You have taken $5,000. You have taken $1,000. You have taken $10. You have taken $1. Return it to him. Oh, you are not moving from here. And remember that that ground is live, huh? That ground is intelligent. It notes that this man is a fasik that is burning under his feet. He said, you're not moving from here. But God over here, I don't have anything to give. I do not care. You have to give it to him. But now you tell me if I don't have anything, what do I do? There has to be a solution. God will say, yes, there is a solution. Haya Labbaik, tell me the solution. I want to move out. This place is too hot. And hot it is, huh? Hot it is. You cannot compare the fire of Akhirah with the fire of dunya. Tradition says, when the Prophet went on Mi'raj, when the Prophet was going on Mi'raj, the first sky, the second sky, the third sky, he was shown some of the punishments that people would face in Jahannam. At that time, one of the things that he saw was people being chained, people being tied and fettered in chains. Chains? Tied right around their bodies. But these chains were not of metal. These chains were not of iron. These chains were made up of fire. At that time the Prophet is saying, are they being subjected to this? Jibreel is saying, yes. These are, being, these are criminals of God and they are punished by being wrapped around by chains of fire. Then the Prophet says, these look to be very hot. Jibreel says, Ya Rasulullah, these are so hot that if I were to just pick out one link from this group, from this series of chain, if I were to pick up one link and drop it onto the earth, all the mountains will become water. All the mountains will become molten and start flowing as a liquid. This is how one link of the judgment of, of the Akhra, the fire, that is how intense it is. Here he is standing on fire and believe me that is hot. At that time God says nothing doing, you have to return one dollar to him. Otherwise you cannot move. He says I don't have money. He's saying in this world there is no money. That one dollar that you had to give was in dunya. Over here there is nothing as dollar and pounds. Huh? Those are not recognized over here. So now what do I do over here? He's saying you have to give something that is the currency of the Akhirah. What is the currency of the Akhra? In the world, we were so fond of dollars, man. Green bills like to touch around. Green bills come into our hands of so nice. He's saying, not over here. Over here, the currency is different. Currency is changed, my friends. In Tanzania, I've got shillings. If I bring shillings over here, who's going to give me a, a can of Coke over here? Doesn't work. I say, what is this? We don't recognize this. If you want a can of Coke, you need to give the currency of this place. U.S. dollars. Correct? Similarly over there, now the money has to be paid. So you can't pay dollars over here because we don't recognize U.S. dollars over here. There is no U.S., there is no Tanzania, there is no nothing because the world is now oh, changed, upheaval it has taken place. Saying, what is the currency of this world? Saying, currency of this world is deeds. So how do I do that? He's saying, you need to give one dollar back. Higher, your good deeds will be transferred to him. Now you understand this position, huh? this person is already a Fasik, this person is already a Fajr, as it is his sins are more, as it is his good deeds are less. Out of those less good deeds, he's been told, I'll pick up more and give it to them. Can you imagine what will happen? 
Here is looking for some good deeds so that that balance takes place equally. The good deeds and the evil balance, that is when he will now be successful. As it is, his good deeds are less. The evil deeds are more. He is trying to get some form of good deeds whereby the scales get balanced. But he said, no, no more good deeds given to you. Your good deeds will be taken from you and given to him because you had not paid the money back to him. Can you imagine what he will go through? Can you imagine what he will go through? It will be taken from him and given to him. But what if it is a thousand dollars? More will be taken and given to him. What if it is ten thousand dollars? More will be taken and given to him. A time will come when he has taken so much money from people, deception, fraud, dhokha, whatever in this world. In this world he thought himself to be too smart. I can trick these people. These are good as a gullible people. No problem. Yes, you get the money over here, but over there, the more the money taken over here, the more the good deeds, the time will come, he will have no good deeds left. All his good deeds gone. Whatever little hope of salvation, he sees transferring from his account to the other account. The Holy Prophet sitting with his companions, he suddenly asks them, Manil Muflis, Muflis, comes from the word fulus. Fulus means money. Arabic. Muflis means somebody who doesn't have money. A poor person. Somebody doesn't have money. All of a sudden the Prophet asks, Man al muflis The companion sitting around, they look around. All of a sudden, oh, what's happened to this Prophet? He's asking us this question. Man al muflis So he says, This is clear, you oh Prophet. A person who doesn't have money is a muflis. He says, no, you're wrong. A person who doesn't have money is not muflis. See, that is what we always use in Arabic terminology. A person is poor, we say, Hada muflis. I say, no, that person is not poor. You want to know who is the real muflis? A real muflis is a person who comes on the day of judgment with loads of salat and loads of som and loads of khums and loads of zakat. And now he is confident when he is standing before God that now he is going to go to paradise. All of a sudden, he has taken somebody's money in this world. He comes and stands, my friend, you are not going till you give me. He says, okay, now if I have to give you, I don't have US dollars, what do I do? Allah says, give salat. The salat is given to him. As he is now wanting to go, somebody else comes, takes away his som. Somebody else come, takes away his hajj. Somebody else come, takes away the rewards of his sal, of his zakat, of his khum. A time comes when that mountain of thawab, nothing remains. This man is muflis, the Prophet says. What money if he's not there, he's a muflis. A muflis is a person who has brought that entire mountain of thawab. But because of his haqqun nas, everything has gone to the nas. Now this man, when he... In the, when it really matters for him to get thawab, and he doesn't have one single thawab, this man is muflis. Not this man who doesn't have money. How long is he going to live in this world? That is not muflis. He's going to be muflis without money. He's going to be poor without money. He's going to be penniless in this world for 50 years. That is not muflis. It is when hereafter, billions of years you don't have money. That is a real muflis. That is a real poor, poor person. Not this one. But the problem becomes even more severe. You know why? A time comes when there are people who have, who have taken things to be taken things so much for granted that they think they can do anything and get away with it. And they just put caution to the winds, trampling on the rights of the people. I'm in need, give me money. Now I'm okay, higher, gone. I don't need to give you. Tradition says there will be people whose sins will be of, whose, whose good deeds will be so much. That now when the mazloom comes, the oppressed person comes, and now he doesn't have money to give him, the, the, the good deeds will be given to him. But there is a possibility that the amount that he has taken in this world is so much, but his, sins are, but his good deeds are less. So all the good deeds gone, but still pending, Bana. Still pending. Now there's a problem. That man is saying, I still have another $50,000 to take from him. But you go to look at his deeds, no good deeds remaining. He wants to go to paradise. This man is not letting him go to paradise. How long is he going to stay over here? You have to take things somewhere. So now things need to move. Now what do we do? No good deeds to transfer. Allah says, don't worry. I've got a lot of mechanism. You don't have good deeds to take? To give it to him. All good deeds finish. But you still have haq that you have taken that you need to restore. What do we do? Simple. Take out his sins and give it to him. 
pick up his sins and give it to him. Sins from this man will be taken and put into him. He says, but I had to give money. You don't have money. You don't have good deeds. What next? Pick up his sins and give it to him. Can you imagine the state of this man? First of all, he had less sins. In front of his eyes, he had less good deeds. In front of his eyes, all his good deeds transferred. Worse come worse. All that evil sin, that zina that he had done, the lies that he had uttered, the kafa that he has done, is now coming into his plate. Is it worth it to take somebody's property in this world? Tell me. We can't bear to give the accountability and bear the punishment of our sins. We will take somebody else's burden. God knows what he has done. Mama. Worth it? Hakunas. No escape. Tradition says, Baba, give the money that you've taken from somebody. Somebody's property, return it back. Allama Jazari is narrating in his book. And this is Ajab Bana. I mean, how much more do you want to be exhorted to return somebody else's property, somebody else's right, somebody else's haq? Allama Jazari says, I have taken a dollar from him. Give me a dollar. I will pay you back in a month's time. After a month, I take this dollar. Brother, thank you very much. You helped me. Just take your dollar back. As soon as I give him the dollar, I will get rewards equivalent and more than 1,000 nights of years of worship, more than rewards of freeing 1,000 slaves in the, in the path of God, and more than the rewards of 1,000 Hajj and Umrah. For what? For having returned the money. Whose money? His money. But God says the very fact that you have returned Hakkunas is such a big thing. I'm going to give you the rewards. A reward of thousand years of worship, a reward of freeing thousand slaves in the path of God, and a reward of thousand Hajj and Umrah for returning the money, His money which I had borrowed. But Allah says this is so important that the very fact that you obeyed my command and returned the Hakkunas, I'm going to reward you. What else do we need to get us to return somebody else's heart? But those who do not return, one tradition, because when I'm telling you the transfer of good deeds, if you want to imagine how much the good deeds would go and how fast we would come to transfer, forgetting the sins of that person, listen to this tradition. This tradition says, for every dirham, that somebody has usurped in this world of somebody else. For every dirham that he has taken illegally and without the shari consent from another person, on the day of judgment that person will accost him, give me my dirham back. For every dirham taken oppressively, for every dirham taken oppressively, 7,000 salat will be transferred to his name. 7,000 are. Huh? 7,000 salat transferred. In a day you got five. In a day you got five. 7,000 divided by tribe, divided by five, is 1,400 days. Multi divided by 365. That means almost four years of salat gone poof for one dirham. Four years, we become balik at the age of 15. Even if we die at the age of 30, at the age of 60, at the age of 60, and we become balik at the age of 15, 45 years of wajib salat, 45 years of wajib salat, over here for every dirham, if four years go, 11 dirhams you've taken, all your salat is finished. 11 dirham, let's put it into perspective. 11 dollars taken, all salat gone. All salat. There's nothing left. Can you imagine how fast you are to accepting his sins now? Salat is five times a day you do it. Fast come 30 days in a year. You are five times a day for one dirham. And in putting into today's perspective, one dollar... Four years of Salat gone. If somebody has taken $11, his Salat is finished. His entire life of Salat that he's done up and down in this world gone in a, in a matter of seconds. Not worth it, my friends. It's not worth it. 
but also over here when we are talking about this and hakunas there is remember i said god will manifest himself in two ways one he will show himself as adil but a time will come that there is always a different behavior when it comes to the ahlul bayt and the shiites of the ahlul bayt and your specific traditions of kama is saying when you will then allah will find a shia over there and he has a problem the adalat will not change he has to pay but here he might give an opportunity to the other to forgive him so if there is somebody another moment this moment has taken that moment's money and that moment wants the money it is very possible god will tell him let him go saying what about my money saying because he is a shia and he is missed out it is not his profession to cheat somebody but for some reason he was not able to pay you back he borrowed the intention is very important huh? he has taken the money before he could pay he died and he did not inform anybody he can't pay he could not have paid you back had he given had he had an opportunity he would have paid you back but my adalat stands if he does not pay he does not go but i have to request you why don't you let him go saying but ya allah i need this money bana i have to get this my haq back he saying okay uh, i will do something if you were to get his haq back you would get two palaces in paradise i, I want that i want it i want to leave it he saying if you forgive him so that he is also going to paradise shia shia walul bayt if you forgive him so that now if you forgive him i can forgive him instead of two i will give you 200 what will he do he saying i i give it to him i forgive and forgive and i want 200 this is how at times he will deal with fadl but that is god's prerogative we cannot say when he will do it we cannot say if he is going to do it in our case but tradition says for certain good people for unfortunate reasons when they are not able to pay the the, the amount back this is how allah subhanahu wa taala will deal with them but over here there are times that we have to understand that over here the final control lies in the hands of god entire existence of man lies in the god nobody can say i did not do it nobody can say no i don't think this is correct because on that day every human being and every part of a human being is in the hands of allah subhanahu wa taala one of the things in this last one before we go into the masail one of the things that individuals are prone to do and will do because of their fitra than habit in this world is that they will start bringing excuses ah stealing i steal no i did not do this i don't remember when did I, stealing so bad i could not have done it zina ya allah i know it somebody does zina the arch of god will shake i could not have done it i think there's some mistake these guys must have messed it up i don't think i would have done it at that time quran says that man and every part of man belongs to god god says you want to put excuses al yawm nakhthimu ala afwahihim wa tukallimuna aydihim wa tashhadu arduluhum bima kanu yaksibun surah yasin verse 65 So the Yasin Allah says a day will come when these people, when they start giving excuses and start trying to portray themselves as the fifteenth masum, we are going to come up with a new mechanism. Al yom nakhthimu ala afwahihim. You want to prove your innocence? We are going to shut your mouth up. We are going to put a seal. You will not talk. Who will talk? Fal yom nakhthimu ala afwahihim. But to kallimu na aydihim, their hands will talk to us. what tashhadu tashhadu arduluhum their legs will talk to us and this is what will happen on the day of judgment when man decides to oppose god by means of stating no i did not do this i am not aware of it i think there must be a mistake i could never have done it god will say you don't talk we will talk to those limbs who have been involved the mouth will be closed and the hands will start speaking ya rabbi yes i stole ya rabbi yes i kicked Ya Rabbi yes I saw pornography Ya Rabbi yes I heard music God says tongue don't move we will talk not to man we will talk to his limbs and they will say on this day this is what we saw and on this day this is what we did and on this day this is what we committed and on this day this is what we killed 
the hands, the legs, the eyes, the ears will start giving speech. And one scenario Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala portrays in the Quran. He portrays in the Quran and he's saying a time will come when we will pass, we want to talk to them and we want to take accounting for them and we will show them, look, your place is hell over there. At that time, at that time, what will happen is that this man will start coming up with excuses. As he's coming up with excuses, we will tell him, you do not talk. Your limbs will talk and his skin and his eyes and his ears tashhadu alayhi sam'uhu wa absaruhu wa juluduhu his eyes will testify against him his ears will testify against him his skin will testify against him when this thing is happening now he is not talking he is seeing his hands talk yes i picked this up to slap somebody his eyes will say ya rabbi yes on this day i was watching this dirty movie his ears will say, yes, I was listening to this music. His skin will say, yes, yes, I was part of everything that he was doing. He is lying. Quran says at that time he will turn to his hands. And he will say, وَيَقُولُونَ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Allah, you are testifying against me. You are part of me. You are myself. You are my body. You are leaving me and you are testifying against me. لِمَا شَهِدْ Quran I am speaking, Baba. These are verses of the Quran. Lema shahidtum alayna. Why are you testifying against us? You are part of me. This is shake. The shake is made up of the skin. Now you want to leave me and turn towards God and tell Him that I did all this? Can you not shut up and keep quiet? At that time, the skin will start speaking. We have been given the authority and the power by God to speak. That God was given power to speak to everybody. And now that we have been able to speak, we will explain and tell everything that you have done because this is the command of God. If somebody from your own house betrays you, where can you go? If your own skin betrays you, what can you do? If your own eyes betray you, what can you do? You can't do anything. You have to say, shut up. You have to say to ourselves, shut up and keep mum. Because all evidences are against us. There is no escape at that time. Everything will be against us if we are not on the right path. But to be on the right path requires efforts and sacrifices and, and putting God before ourselves. You and me, or other me might not be able to do it. Because I'm more concerned about myself than God. But there are people who have done it. There are people who have done it. And this is what we have come, Muharram is for that. These are the people who have no fear. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون They are not worried about death. They are not worried about akhara. They are not worried about anything. Only thing that they are worried about is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when after the tragedy of Karbala, when in the, in the court of Yazid, in the court of Yazid, Yazid very, uh, in a criticizing manner, turns to Zalim and says, Kaifara'ayti sun Allah bi akhik al Hussein. How did you like the, the, the role played by God in the destruction of Hussein? How did you like it? He's saying, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I have never seen from God anything except good. So what if he's taken my, my brother Hussein? It is a good act. Because if he's happy, I'm happy. These are the individuals. And these are one of the individuals today that we have come. Ali Akbar. 18 year old. But the ma'arifat of God. You don't need to go to Hussein and Fatima for salvation. Hold Ali Akbar and we are through. This, this is what started off. The caravan leaves Makkah. As they are on the way towards, towards Karbala, in the middle, the pitch tends. Hussein, for a few moments, goes to sleep. Akbar is beside him. All of a sudden, Hussein gets up and decides, Istirja, inna lillah, wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Akbar surprised. He's saying, Baba, what time is this of reciting Istirja? Oh, we are not in a battle right now. Why are you reciting inna lillah? He's saying, while I was sleeping, I heard a voice say, this caravan is going, but death is coming to me, this caravan. At the thought of death, I recited in Nalilla. So Akbar is asking him, but, uh, but we are on truth, isn't it? He says, yes, we are on truth. Akbar says, if that is the case, then I'm not worried. If I meet death or if death meets me, 
How many of our 18 year old can say that? How many? How many of our 18 year olds can say that? But this entire kafla keeps going. As they reach Karbala, night of Ashur comes, day of Ashur comes. On the day of Ashur, in this entire group of 72 odd people of Hussein, Ali Akbar stands out. Stands out for one reason. Because he is the only martyr who has not been brought up by his own mother. Akbar's mother, Layla. But it is not Layla who has brought him up. Akbar has been brought up by Zainab Kubra. He's more attached to Zainab than to Layla. Anything happens, he's with Layla, with, with Zainab. The upbringing with Zainab. Whatever he wants from Zainab. It is the wish of Hussein. Because Akbar has always been with Zainab from the time he has been small. Anything that he would want, he would go to Zainab. Auntie, I want this. Zainab would give. Auntie, I have this problem. She would solve it. From the time he was small till now he's become 18 years. Every time it is only Zainab. Because Zainab is brought like Ona Muhammad more than that. More than that. Because she cried over Akbar. She never cried over Ona Muhammad so much. It is always the desire of Hussein. I wish my son would ask something from me. Whenever he would go to him, even in Medina, even in Makkah, Akbar, do you need something? Saying, Baba, I don't need anything. Aunt's giving me everything. Akbar, do you want something? Aunt's giving me everything. Should I bring you something? No, I don't need Baba. Aunt is giving me everything. Whenever Hussein would ask, Akbar, can I give you? Do you want something from me? Ask from me. He would always say, no, it is always my aunt who is given. I don't need to ask you. Akbar never asked from Hussein anything. Akbar never asked from Hussein anything. Yes, one occasion he asked from Hussein, but the occasion when he asked from Hussein, Hussein could not give it to him. Hussein could not give because the first time when Akbar went to the battlefield, he comes back and says, Ya oh my father, Al Adashoka the Kajalani, the thirst is killing me. Is there a little water that you can give me? First time in his life, Akbar is asking Hussein for something, but the first time Akbar asked, Hussein cannot give. <coughs> he says, Akbar, first time you are asking me something, but your father cannot give you the water. Put your tongue into my mouth. Akbar puts his tongue into the mouth so that he can get some wetness from Hussein's mouth. Tradition says, as soon as he puts his tongue inside the mouth of Hussein, he pulls it out. He's saying, you've got more thorns in your mouth than mine. Your mouth is drier than mine, Baba. <laughs> Hussein goes for the battlefield. Abba, Hussein says, Akbar go to the battle. Hussein, Akbar goes for the battle. As he is battling, Hussein is watching him. The first time he makes an attack, champions come, he kills those champions. Till a time comes when everybody surround Ali Akbar. Everybody surround Ali Akbar. One 18 year old child, a youth, three days hungry, three days thirsty. How much could he fight? But the fight that he gave was because of that blood of Ali that was there. Eventually a time comes when he's surrounded and a lance begins to move, a spear begins to move and finds its way into the chest of Akbar. As soon as he hits Akbar, now Akbar's weakness is too much. He totters onto the horse, then he falls down. As he falls down, Wa alaykum inni salam ya abata. Oh my father Hussain, accept Akbar's salam. As soon as Hussain hears Akbar's salam, he comes rushing forward. Aina aina Akbar. Aina aina Akbar. At that point of time, as he reaches, he sees his son, lying in a pool of blood on his chest a little small portion of the spear the handle of which was broken how a father can see the state of the child in front of him a 18 year old youth he says Akbar don't worry I am going to pick out this spear from your body he bends down he puts his hand onto the, the, the head of the spear as he pulls it out the spear comes out but two things two things else also come out as soon as the spear comes out first of all blood sprouts out and together with the blood the soul of Akbar comes out the dead body of Akbar lying in the hands of his father 
और इसी वजह यहां हमें पुरसा देना है हुसैन को अकबर का नौ मुहर्रम अकबर की तारीख है ये तमाम रातें हमने गुजारी अब हमें मुस्तकीमन हुसैन को पुरसा देना है अठारह बरस का कड़ियल जवान अठारह बरस का कड़ियल जवान मगर ये सिलसिला जो है कुछ ऐसे वाकयात को बयान करूंगा इंसान का जिगर फट जाता है इंसान का जिगर फट जाता है इसीलिए तो हमें पुरसा देना है हुसैन का अकबर का पुरसा रसूल को देना है क्योंकि शबी है रसूल है हुसैन का पुरसा अली को देना है क्योंकि हम नाम है अली के अकबर का पुरसा देना है फातिमा को क्योंकि अकबर की उम्र फातिमा जैसी है अकबर का पुरसा देना है हसन को क्योंकि अकबर में हसन के अखलाक है और अकबर का पुरसा देना है हुसैन को क्योंकि पूरा हुसैन अकबर का है और अकबर हुसैन का एक मरतबा शब आशूर गुजर चुकी रोज आशूर नमेदार हुई सवेरे का वक्त है हुसैन के एक मुआजन है जो हमेशा अजान के वक्त जो है वो अजान देता है नमाज के वक्त अजान देता है मगर इस बार आज के दिन आशूर की सवेरे हुसैन ने उसको ना बुलाया हुसैन ने कहा ऐना अकबर ऐना अकबर अली अकबर कहा है अली अकबर को बुलाओ अली अकबर को कहा गया बाबा बुला रहे जी बाबा फरमाया आपने कुछ कहा बेटे आज अजान तुम दो बेटे अजान तुम दो आप जानते हैं ना ये अकबर वो है कि जिसका लहजा रसूल का लहजा ये अकबर वो है कि जिसकी सूरत रसूल की सूरत ये अकबर वो है जिसकी सीरत रसूल की सीरत बेटे अजान आज तुम दो अजान का वक्त हुआ एक मरतबा अकबर ने कहा अल्लाह अकबर अरे अकबर की आवाज निकली मगर रसूल का लहजा दशत करबला में गूंजने लगा जैसे आवाज खेमे में पहुंची एक मरतबा जैनब ने सुना अरे ये नाना की आवाज मदीने का रुख किया ए नाना ए नाना अजान तमाम हुई कि एक मरतबा जंग छिड़ी पहले हमले में तकरीबन चालीस अफराद मारे गए आधे से ज्यादा लश्कर हुसैन का मारा गया मारा गया अब बनी हाशिम की बारी आई तो सबसे पहले हुसैन ने कहा कि सबसे पहले कुर्बानी हुसैन देंगे सबसे पहले हुसैन की कुर्बानी अकबर तकदम या वो नहीं या सबसे पहले शहादत का मजा मेरे बेटे के जरिए से हुसैन चखेगा हुसैन जो है बर्दाश्त करेगा हुसैन अकबर चलो बेटा अकबर निकलते हैं एक मर्तबा शान से निकलते हैं मगर कुछ जंग करने के बाद आते हैं और फिर वही दोहराते हैं कहते बाबा प्यास मुझे मारे डाल रही है ये संगीनी मुझे मारे डाल रही है उस वक्त हुसैन कहते बेटा थोड़ा थोड़ा सबर कर लो थोड़ा सबर कर लो अब जब जाओगे तो तुम्हारे नाना जाम कौसर से तुम्हें सैराब करेंगे इसका मतलब क्या पता है इसका मतलब के बेटा अकबर जाओ अब नाना खुदा हाफिज अब मुलाकात तुम्हारी नाना रसूल खुदा के साथ अम्मा फातिमा के साथ बाबा अली के साथ जाओ अकबर बेटा मगर जैसे अकबर चलते हैं घोड़े पर और घोड़े की रफ्तार बढ़ी एक मरतबा कुछ आवाज आई पीछे से कुछ आवाज आई एक मरतबा घोड़े को रोकते हैं और पीछे मुड़कर देखते हैं अरे क्या देखा सत्तावन साल का बूढ़ा इमाम पकन कमर पे हाथ रखे अरे बेटे के पीछे पीछे आ रहा ए बुनैया महलन महला महलन महला आहिस्ते जाओ बेटा संभाल के जाओ बेटा ख्याल रख के जाओ बेटा अरे अकबर ने जैसे देखा घोड़े से उतर आए हाथों को जोड़ा अरे बाबा ये क्या कर रहे हैं कहते बेटा मैं तुम्हारे पीछे पीछे आ रहा अकबर कहते बाबा अगर ऐसे करे अकबर मक्सल में नहीं जा सकेगा बाबा आप ना आइए अकबर से कहते हैं हुसैन बेटा तुम्हारे लिए आसान है कहना क्योंकि तुम बाप नहीं बने तुम्हारे पास अठारह बरस का कड़ियल जवान नहीं 
جاؤ بیٹا خدا حافظ خدا تمہارا نگے دار ایک مرتبہ اکبر نکلتے ہیں اور حسین ایک ٹیلی پہ جا کر کھڑے ہو جاتے ہیں ایک مرتبہ تیرے سے کھڑے ہو کر اکبر کا جہاد دیکھتے ہیں جیسے اکبر کسی کو جو ہے واصل جہنم کرتے ہیں وہاں حسین کہتا ہے مرحبا اکبر مرحبا اکبر مگر ایک مرتبہ پھر دیکھتے ہیں کہ وہ حسین ابن نمیر کی برچی چلی اور سینے میں لگی سینے میں لگنی تھی تو وہ برچی کا ٹوٹنا پھل کا سینے میں گھس جانا اور وہاں سے اکبر کا زمین پر گرنا السلام علیک یا بتا اے بابا میرا سلام جیسے اکبر گھوڑے سے زمین پر گرے یہاں ٹیلے سے حسین زمین پر گرے اور روایت مختل بتاتی ہے جیسے حسین زمین پر گرے کچھ دیر کے لیے آنکھوں کی روشنی جا چکی کچھ نظر نہیں آ رہا ایک مرتبہ اٹھتے ہیں آئینہ آئینہ اکبر اے بیٹا اکبر نظر نہیں آ رہا مجھے پکارو مجھے پکارو وہاں سے اکبر پکارتے ہیں ہنا ہنا یہاں بابا یہاں بابا روایت بتاتی ہے ستاون سال کا بوڑھا امام آنکھوں کی روشنی جا چکی لڑکھڑاتے گرتے اٹھتے سنبھلتے گرتے ایک تکلیف سے اکبر کے پاس پہنچتے ہیں جیسے اکبر کے پاس پہنچے ایسا منظر دیکھا کہ کسی بوڑے باپ کو نہ دکھائے ارے اٹھارہ سال کا نوجوان خون میں آلودہ بیٹا علی اکبر ایک جملہ کہتے ہیں حسین بیٹا اکبر تم تو اب جا چکے اپنے باپ کو تنہا چھوڑ گئے باپ اکیلا رہ گا ایک مرتبہ پھر متوجہ ہوئے کہ اکبر کا ہاتھ سینے پہ ہے کہ اکبر یہ کیا ہے کتب درد ہو رہا ہے بابا کتب ہاتھ اٹھاؤ کتب نہیں ہٹانا ہے بابا کتب اکبر ہاتھ اٹھاؤ ہاتھ ہٹاؤ تمہارا باپ ابھی اتنا صابر ہے کہ وہ دیکھ سکے کہ کیا ہے ہاتھ ہٹاؤ اب جیسے ہاتھ ہٹایا ارے برچی کا ٹوٹا پھل اکبر کے نوجوان سینے میں ارے آنکھوں سے آنس اجاری جھکتے بیٹا فکر نہ کر علی مرتضی کا بیٹا ہوں میں اس برچی کو نکالوں گا گھٹنوں کے بل جھکتے ہیں سیدھے ہاتھ کو برچی کے پھل پر رکھا دائنے الٹے ہاتھ کو سیدھے ہاتھ پر رکھا ایک مرتبہ نجف کا رکھ کیا یا رکنی برچی کو نکالا برچی کے ساتھ اکبر کا جگر زمین کربلا میں زلزلہ ارے زینب خیمے میں زلزلہ محسوس کرنے لگی باہر نکلی اے بھائیہ مدد کی ضرورت ہو تو بہن آ جائے ارے جیسے زینب کی آواز سنی ارے لاشا اکبر کو چھوڑا زینب کی طرف مڑے اے زینب خیمہ سے باہر نہ آنا میرے اکبر کو تیری چادر پر قربان کر چکا خیمہ سے باہر نہ آنا وزی عالم اللذین ظلمو ایم انقلب ینقلبون علا ولا عنت اللہ علا وقوم اللہ یہ میرا نور نظر یہ میرا لخت جگر مشکل سے گھر پردہ اٹھا لو کوئی کچھ نہ کرو کی لوکل اس کا ہے اب غیر حال 
کرنے کو 